It's all right. I'm quite comfortable up here. I don't feel at all self-conscious. Okay. I'm going to talk about these two things. It's a weirdly high number of connections with Yeta's talk, which is absolutely good, right? You can hear me okay. I'm not sure how far away to hold this thing. Works? Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm going to talk. There's going to be a strong underlying current of surveillance in what I'm saying, but I'm going to leave the really hardcore stuff to the panel. Okay, what I want to talk about is the kind of, despite the surveillance that's going on, what might be the pos positive possibilities still uh, latent in this stuff that we're here to talk about the tech. Oh, yeah, so I forgot this. Uh, I hope the internet's still working for me. Yeah, cool. So I thought I'm not going to cover the slides with a load of links or worry people about writing stuff down or anything like that. So I did, I don't know if you can see that. It looks really dotty up here. You can see it okay, right. So I've done what, what academics like to call a bibliography, right, which just basically means a list of stuff, a list of the stuff that I looked at when I was preparing this talk. So most of the stuff that I talk about is in, is in this list, and I'll refer to it a couple of times. It's just an etherpad. That's just like a shared scratch pad. It's on the internet. You can find it. You can follow the stuff. That's where it is, etherpad.mozilla.org slash docutech hyphen McQuillan. I'll put it up again at the end. So I want to talk about this kind of ambiguity, right? the light and the dark. I want to talk about that stuff within technology. Okay? I find it useful to talk about affordances. It's just a word. It basically means that, yes, technology has certain characteristics. You can do some things, and you can't do other things. But those characteristics are not closed. They're open, right? and they can be unexpected if you approach the stuff in the right way. This is from the... Uh, Closer? Ah, okay. This is from the early days of the iPad, when somebody thought to themselves, okay, iPad, it's a computing device. I wonder how good it is as a skateboard. Okay, and you can find the video of that online, actually. It turns out that the iPad is really crap as a skateboard. Anyway, but it's still, it's, still, it's, it's just a kind of, it's a bit of a fun way of saying the uses of technology are not fixed Particularly, they're not fixed by the things that the people who made it designed it for. If you take a different kind of attitude towards technology, you can use it for something else. And here's a more practical example. The Amazon wedding registry. By the way, this works. You get married, right? And you, the people who get married have a list of things that they want. You visit the uh, wedding registry if you're going to be a guest at the wedding. There's a list of things you can buy. You can click and buy it off Amazon, of course, and then it gets taken off the list. And there was a hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, which devastated some communities, particularly poorer communities, on the east coast of America. Right? And, and there was a bunch of people from Occupy, called themselves Occupy Sandy, and they said, okay, how are we going to help? These communities need stuff. We need a place to put the list. Where can we put the list of stuff? We'll put it on Amazon Wedding Registry. Okay? So they thought, that's really good. It was put up there for weddings, but we can use it for something else. We can hack it. You know, people need to refrigerate food. They need lots of things. There's a long list of things on the Amazon Wedding Registry that the community... Uh, uh, that were, were hit by Hurricane Sandy needed. So that's this idea of affordances, right? You've got to have a certain perspective, a certain attitude, a certain approach to the technology, and you can find different uses for it. And maybe uses that have, well, maybe uses that have more of a social purpose than the reason these tools are built. I've no idea what this graphic actually means, but it kind of serves my purposes, I think, right? Which, uh, there's a bit of a meme going around called Space Cat, and then I, I quite like this one, right? But what it means to me is that essentially looking at the tools that we're given, okay, it probably doesn't come as a surprise to anybody here to know that Facebook is not your friend, okay? Facebook is not providing a service for you, right? You are providing a service for Facebook. It's not actually there to keep the diaspora in touch with the families in Kosovo or anything else. Its purpose is telos. It's not friendship and community and family, okay? Its purpose is to gather data on your relationships, on your preferences, on your activities, and on your location, to compile those into profiles and to monetize them. That is what Facebook exists for, okay? And that is why, actually, to, to sort of touch the theme that covers today's talks, that is why 
Facebook and the NSA are not really so different. And I'm not just picking on Facebook. Obviously, they're big enough for me to pick on them, right? They don't really care, okay? But it's not just Facebook. It's any of these products of Silicon Valley, Instagram or Twitter or whatever else it is, right? They're th simply there, right, to track your relationships and monetize your data. And that's why the business model of Silicon Valley is pretty synonymous with the threat model of the NSA. They're all in the same business. In actual fact, the guys who work for them often move across pretty seamlessly. I met a guy from the, an ex-NSA employee, weirdly, in a lunch queue, like happened to be standing in front of me. And he works in sometimes in startups, then he works back in the NSA, then he works in startups. It's, that's how the Silicon Valley is, Spook Valley. Right? And the reason it works is because it's all the same business. It's tracking. I'm going to do something probably really f stupid now and try a live demo of something. Yeah, fatal, isn't it? Really bad idea. I just wanted to illustrate a little bit. Uh, let me reset that stuff. This is a nice uh, add-on produced by Firefox, uh, well, produced by Mozilla, sorry, for Firefox. Uh, last year's Mozilla Festival had a big security and privacy theme because of the Snowden revelations. And they, they kind of beefed up this tool that one of, their, uh, guy, uh, one of their techs had just made over a weekend. And this just gives you a sense of, this isn't social networks, this is just the web, right? So let's say if we visit the New York Times, just for the sake of it. Okay, up pops the New York Times. And magically, any moment now, I thought this might happen. What I'm expecting to happen, <laughs> yay! Okay, there's some other little things, right? Somewhere, that's in the New York Times in the middle, and these are our third party. Third party means it's not the New York Times, and it's not you, it's somebody else. These are third party cookies, little bits of JavaScript, who are also interested in the fact that you visited the New York Times. Okay, and why shouldn't they be? New York Times is a business, it wants to know demographics of its users, Blah, blah, blah. Let's have a look what happens then if you then decide you want to visit the Huffington Post. Okay, up pops the Huffington Post. And little third party trackers also popping up. Uh, hopefully, going to be a really key moment here. Yay! Okay, it's like biology. They've joined, they've merged. It's the opposite of uh, whatever that thing is when cells split, right? Here's a third party tracker that both sides use. Okay, now that's interesting because that's a third party. That isn't a site you're visiting. There's no volition or choice there. You're not visiting that site. You don't even know they exist unless you're using something like this. But they know that you visited the New York Times and watched, looked at these articles, and then you visited the Huffington Post and looked at those articles. Do one more just for the sake of it, since it's actually working. Okay, some gaming site. Up it pops. Now this is kind of, you know, as far as tracking goes, this is pretty, you know, this is pretty basic stuff, right? It's just cookies, and it's not illegitimate, okay? There are commercial reasons for doing this stuff, okay? As there are commercial reasons for Facebook to record all your data and track all your relationships. But just think about what's happening, okay? Invisible to you, unknown to you most of the time, you're being compiled into a profile of somebody who visits these sites, somebody who likes these things. If this was Facebook, this would be your family relationships. This would be the people living in Kosovo. This would be the Shatsi, okay? Whatever it is, right? Your social networks, your relationships, the things you like, being analyzed mathematically and commoditized and monetized. Ah, I better get out of this. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, so I said I'd save the, um, save the really dark stuff. Let me give you a kind of bit of a teaser. Hopefully some people will stay for the surveillance panel, right? This is quite bad news. Because it doesn't stop at tracking. It doesn't stop at profiling. Never mind the NSA for a moment. Right? The huge potential of this data is now something that institutions and governments and employees are wa employers are waking up to. What they can do if they start to dig into this data. Right? Key words here are data mining okay? and machine learning. And that's what it sounds like. Right? That's computers learning about us, finding patterns, finding connections, finding correlations, and making decisions about us based on those patterns. Okay. So leaving that bit of the dark stuff for the panel in detail, I just want to concentrate for the moment on what do we do about that if we think we should do something. In other words, how do we continue to use the internet? How do we continue to use technology? How do we continue to bother with hacking if it's all owned 
by people who simply want to spy on us, basically. What do we do about it? So my, my preference is to uh, think about this in terms of what's called a critical pedagogy, right? So critical means it's questioning, and pedagogy is like a way of learning about stuff. Because education, and I'm going to talk a little bit about education because it seems so crucial in Kosovo, right? And particularly to the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about it later on. But education, it's a way of learning. There's a couple of ways of learning. There's many ways of learning. But here's two contrasting ways of learning. You go to school. Here's a load of knowledge. It gets transferred into your head. That's it. Okay, that's one way of learning. Another way of learning is to start from your life. Where are you at? And try and understand it. I right, try and think about what's going on here, like Yeta does with the program. Right? What's really going on under the hood? Why are things like they are? Why is my community like this? Why is my life like this? Why are my choices restricted in this way? What can I do about it? Right? That's critical pedagogy. This is a guy called Paolo Freire. He was uh, around in the 1960s, and he was particularly good at expressing these things. I'm just going to try and quote from him. Education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate the integration of generations into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity to it, or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. That's fighting talk. So what do we do about that? Well, what me and a, a bunch of friends did a few years ago was start a thing called Social Innovation Camp. Okay, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a kind of thing. It started in 2007, but now there's, there's hundreds and thousands of these kind of events, really. A weekend of hacking and rapid prototyping, in our case, it was, it's about social purposes, right? We just said to people, what really bothers you? Or what are you really passionate about? What do you want to do? What do you want to change? Is it looking after elderly relatives who don't live in the same town as you? Is it making more bicycle lanes in your city? It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be anything, right? If you've got an idea, come along. We'll get some people together for a weekend. We'll make a working version. Right? That's the robot rapid prototyping thing. We'll make something that works, and we'll go from there. This is just one example of the projects that came out of it. A guy said... I can't be bothered to do exercise because I don't find it motivating, but I could do it if, if I went on a run, and as part of that run, I visited, because I know that there's isolated older people in my community, and I could just drop in you know, on, on the old guy who lives in the tower block. Maybe I could bring him a newspaper, just say hello. Nobody's there. His family's dead or disappeared or they moved to a different country, whatever it is. I could just say hello, break his isolation. I carry on with my run. Which it seems, actually still seems like a slightly bonkers idea, but anyway, he set up that project, Social Innovation Camp. It started to grow, and it's, and it's going, and it's working. But it also changed in the way these startup type things do, and that it turns out that the best way to do it is actually to run in a group. People like to run in groups. And also, if you've got a group of people, you can do stuff. They have the thing in, in Kosovo, you have, uh, what's it called? Let's do it Kosovo, right? The cleanup day. People know about that one. Right? You can do a small version of that. You've got 40 people on a run, 20 people on a run. You can go to some school, some part of the community, do a job. That's too big for one or two people to do. Do it very quickly and carry on. That's how the good gym, the good gym works. That's an example of the kind of stuff that comes out of uh, or came out of social innovation camp, and we've been doing them here. We've done four social innovation camps in uh, Kosovo in partnership with the UNICEF Innovations Lab, and there are some projects that have come out of it. The benefits of something like social innovation camp are not only that projects come out of it. There's a benefit from doing it because you take that kind of thinking into every other area of your life. Right? But projects do come out of it. I think yesterday there was a wor workshop by Localizo. Yeah? That's a project that's a, an alumni of a Social Innovation Camp Kosovo. There's Eventor, I think, is based in Prizren. Uh, there's the Droplet water shortage app that launched recently in uh, Pristina. There, there are some projects that have started to come out of uh, Social Innovation Camp in Kosovo. But there's a problem. Right? It's all very well having a fantastic weekend and doing lots of rapid prototyping and believing you can change the world, and then you have to go back to reality. Okay? That's my vision of reality. <laughs> it's, uh, it's got a bit of light and dark. It's got lots of lines in it as well. It's actually, this is actually a, a, a scientific term called striation. basically means lots of boundaries and barriers. You find it in rocks. Right? And that's how life can be if you're trying to do innovative new stuff. There's just so many barriers. You go back to your job. You go back to your institution, whatever it is, you try to do something new, there's no money, people don't like the idea, that's not in your job description, what are your friends going to think? Whatever it is, there's lots of barriers. Okay, it's very hard to actually change things. It's very easy to have a cool idea, it's nice to go away with some mates and hack some stuff, it's very hard to actually make a difference in the world. So what do you do? 
Well, maybe one possibility is to say startups. They're free of all that crap, right? They don't have hierarchies. They don't have institutional memory. They don't have lots of policies. They don't have a human resources department. Maybe, maybe startups is the way. And you know, Social Innovation Camp has actually evolved one part of it down that road, right? We've, we've, we have a thing called Bethnal Green Ventures, and that's a, an incubator uh, for social tech startups. So stuff that works on a problems of aging, problems of education, problems of uh, energy and environment. And the link's on the list, that list on the Etherpad. You can go and have a look at the projects. Some of them are really amazing. Some of them are quite successful. Okay, but I still think there's a problem. Okay, and this is where I would totally connect and, you know, kind of, Yeta did half my job for me, in a way, I think, in talking about the stuff that she did. Because a big problem is, and it's, it's quite a big idea, in a way, I would say is this thing called neoliberalism. I don't know if people have heard this term before. Neoliberalism, does that ring a bell with anybody? A few hands going up, yay. Okay, yay for neoliberalism. No, no, boo neoliberalism, right? This is actually a, a cool graphic. This is of um, high frequency trading because a lot of the markets, the money markets in the world now, it's not people trading shares and futures, it's computers doing it. And they do it hundreds of times a second, which can be quite scary because of some of the effects that happen. I'm just putting up there as an illustration. Neoliberalism is a much bigger idea. Neoliberalism says markets are the answer to everything. And not just the answer, actually. Neoliberalism says markets are the explanation of everything, right? Because neoliberalism also posits the idea that our brains are markets, right? There's a market of neurons going on in here. And that's why we eventually think the things that we do. Okay, so neoliberalism is no, by no means restricted simply to business. But anyway, that's its main application, privatization. Right? Privatization is the ultimate neoliberal sort of front line. And, I, and neoliberalism is the ideas that have been imposed on Kosovo since the war. Right? You are living in a neoliberal vision. Right? The privatization of everything. The market will sort it out. Optimization, efficiency, profit maximization. This is how things work best. And that's why Kosovo has got that stuff going on, okay? But also, unfortunately, that's exactly what powers Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is ultimately a neoliberal model. Everything about social media, from the attention economy, which I'm guessing might be a little like some of the stuff that Diana talked about yesterday, right the way through to the invisible data market, it's a neoliberal technology framework, okay? So I think there's a problem in that that's not gonna be the social solution, because in neoliberalism doesn't come stuff like uh, Fairness, justice, right? Hayek, one of the great thinkers of neoliberalism, right? He actually said, there, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't compute, right? There's no such thing as justice. That's not the product of this stuff. This product is maximizing efficiency, optimization of resources, right? It's not about fairness or justice or solidarity or any of that stuff, okay? I am, that's why I don't think it's the answer to everything. That's what, why I don't think that just saying, okay, we'll make up some cool social startups is gonna be the answer. So what's your answer then? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know exactly, okay? I'm gonna offer some ideas and then talk about a practical project. I'll get onto something practical in a minute and away from all this uh, idea stuff. That's not really working, how's that? Let's try it. That's better. Okay, so I don't know what the answer is because of course there isn't one answer, but one thing I'm proposing here as part of DocuFest is the idea of hacktivism, okay? So that's got a bit of hacking in it, and hacking can mean messing around with technology systems, but hacking can simply mean, and has ever since the beginning of hacking, creatively overcoming okay, obstacles. It can mean producing unintended things from the materials to hand. It can mean lots of these things. The idea of hacking, but hacktivism is the idea of hacking for a kind of social purpose. At least that's how I'm interpreting it. Okay, so I'd say one possible uh, alternative route okay, that isn't old style institutions or simply saying startups will solve everything, I'm saying, okay, let's think about this idea of hacktivism as hacking for a social purpose. I just want to say, by the way, to sort of uh, differ slightly from where Yeta was coming from, I say, if, if, if we're waiting for civil society to save us, we're fucked, okay? I worked for civil society for years, all right? We cannot afford to wait for civil society to save us. Civil society is as straighted as any other institution. It has its own agendas, it has its own motivators. Okay, it's, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we can't rely on civil society. Okay, we have to find other models as well. 
So what do I mean by hacktivism? I'm, I'm, getting to, I'm getting to the practical bit, right? Well, the first thing in relation to surveillance is, in general, hackers are good to have around because they understand this stuff. They understand surveillance and also the countervailing technologies like cryptography. This is just a flyer that I like for a thing that I've participated in organizing, which are crypto parties. And crypto parties are events a bit like this, but except we'd all be sitting around with laptops and we'd be teaching each other how to use email encryption, how to use disk encryption, how to browse without being tracked using a tool called Tor. We'd be using uh, encrypted real-time chat. We'd be doing that kind of stuff. Okay, that's what crypto parties do. So that's a good example, actually, of hacktivism. And I taught a course last year at the University of Pristina, and we did organize a mini crypto party, and we did it in the rectorate building, which I now look back on with an ironic smile, okay? The fact that we organized the first crypto party in Kosovo in the rectorate. But, so hackers are good because they, you know, having hacktivistic social approaches to hacktivism can be very good because of the, the problems of surveillance and tracking. But I think uh, hacktivism is about, uh, is about more than that. It's about actually something much more positive and productive. And, and the case study I want to look at, really, is to do with this, it's the kind of the, the stuff that's really coming down the line now. If you're looking at technology, and, you, and that, that was a train tunnel, and there was something coming right at us right now, th this is what it is, actually. Not this slot in particular, but the idea of the Internet of Things. Right, the Internet of Things, I don't know, is that kind of something that's talked about here yet? Yeah, people are starting to talk about it, right? The Internet of Things. It's, it's data processing and sensors and connectivity of some kind in stuff. Right, in pretty much everything. I mean, obviously, this thing is the, uh, the, one of the starter examples of the Internet of Things, the smartphone. And that's one of the drivers right, of the technology becoming cheap enough, and cheap enough and effective enough to have all these other fantasies, if you like. I've no idea whether you can read any of that. I can't read it from here because of the pixelation. right? But it's, it's, it's just a chart, one amongst thousands, from a bunch who make Internet of Things and sensor devices saying, oh, how could the world be? How great the world will be when we have all this stuff, okay? Imagine, this is the kind of Internet of Things, right? Imagine, right, your garden sprinkler. I am kind of doubting, actually, that most people here right now actually have garden sprinklers, but let's say some people do. I notice there are some green lawns, and they usually have either some poor bloke with a hose or a garden sprinkler, right? Imagine you've got a garden sprinkler, and it has sensors, right? It can tell how wet the soil is or dry, so it can decide when to come on. Great. Imagine if that sprinkler is connected to the Internet and has some intelligence, some processing power, right? Then it can read the metadata that's coming from the weather forecasting site and decide what the weather's going to be over the next few days and decide how much it needs to come on, right? That's the idea of the Internet of Things, this amazing world that sort of functions in this helpful way to optimize garden lawns and everything else, really. Much more important stuff as well, like health, right? If it monitors your vital body signals, if you're somebody that's got any kind of health problem, right? And you can wear a sensor that tells you about small changes. For example, you can get an asthma inhaler that talks to your smartphone right, and will track when you use the inhaler and start to give you information about how you can optimize your inhaler use and maybe you know, when you're most at risk or how to be more effectively without asthma attacks. Okay, so, so, so when it starts to get to stuff like that, it starts to become more significant. Uh, the problem with the Internet of Things is the theme that's run through definitely ran through Yeta's talk and really, to some extent, mine, I suppose, is this light and dark thing. This idea of affordances cuts both ways, right? This stuff can be pretty bad. It, just imagine that world. Now you know what we know about the NSA. Imagine a world where everything is sensing and everything is talking to the Internet, including bits of our body or stuff on bits of our body. This is a thing called Fit. This is one of the products of a company called Fitbit. Has anyone got a Fitbit device? Yay! Right. Fitbit devices, right? They can be very motivational because they give you data on your exercise. Right? And you can share that data as well with your mates. You can compete against your friends. You can get a long-term view of your own health gains. If you check out the terms of service on the Fitbit website, like the terms of service on every other bit of social media, then you start to, you know, the, the, the sort of shine starts to go off it because it turns out that you don't own the data about your own body. Right? You don't own the data about what you've been doing, where you've been, how hard you were breathing when you did that. Okay. Basically, that belongs to Fitbits. And Fitbit's uh, new business model, one of its most successful business models, is, at the moment in the States anyway, is selling Fitbit devices en masse to employers who can then tune the, uh, it, because it's a privatized healthcare system in the USA, they can tune their, their health 
insurance contributions based on how fit their employees are. So don't be fat, be fit, and you might have more money coming off your salary. Okay, that's the way. This, imagine now. Imagine that's one thing. Imagine this stuff in the hands of the NSA. Okay, so there's a lot of downsides. I'm getting a bit into the downsides. I want to get into the upsides. What's the upsides of the Internet of Things? This is the practical project I want to talk about. The upside of the Internet of Things. If you take critical pedagogy on board, if you take a hacktivist approach, what can you do with sensors? What can you do with devices? This is a project that falls right in the middle of the larger debate that Fieta was talking about, about power and energy and coal-fired power plants in Kosovo and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's part of a new uh, emerging area called citizen science. Citizen science partly exists now because uh, we've got the kit, right? We can do the science. We can do the measurements. We don't need big budgets. We don't need big organizations, etc., etc. So we've got the kit, but we've also got the needs, right? In Kosovo, uh, the air quality problem is really becoming quite severe in certain places because obviously the power plant, the dominant wind direction for Obelich and Plementina is directly towards Pristina, right? You've got Pristina's already over-polluted because of traffic. You've also got the stuff coming straight from the power plants. There are various other um, industrial sites around uh, Kosovo that are a serious cause for concern. So Science for Change, Kosovo's first focus is um, air quality. Okay? And it's a project in conjunction with uh, myself and the UNICEF Innovations Lab and another organization called Transitions. I just want to show you a little bit about it, uh, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Ah, <laughs> cool. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, this is just a, 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 a sort of write-up of the launch, but it's got some photos. Okay, the idea of citizen science. Citizen science, in a way, is also hacking science because it's not actually about experts, right? It's about understanding, uh, it's about this pedagogy. It's the idea of the community saying, okay, let's figure out for ourselves what we think the problems are, okay? And let's decide for ourselves how we're going to go about investigating that. Of course, we might want uh, specialist or professional support in some of that, but we, we make the decisions. We decide what's worrying us. We decide what the priorities are. We decide what needs to be measured. We question the experts. This is a panel. I mean, actually, these experts at least had the bottle, had the courage to come along and be grilled by the young participants. So, so we've got representatives of the municipality of civil society and of the Environmental Protection Agency, and good for them because they did come along right, and have a dialogue with young people about why it's not satisfying at the moment what's happening with the environment that goes over and what people are or aren't doing about it. But citizen science is not really about discourse. It's not really about debate. It's about doing stuff. At the moment, we're just doing two or three things, basically. We started in June. The two th main things we're doing is putting up these tubes. Right? These are not digital. These are chemical tubes. They go on a post, and they measure two things, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. And they're very, very accurate. You send them back to a lab, you get a super calibrated, accurate reading of the monthly average. That's one thing we're doing. Uh, and the other thing we're doing is we're putting up these things called smart citizen kits. And they're little devices based on Arduino, which you might have heard of. That's one of the things that makes the Internet of Things hackable. It's a little electronics board. Right? You can make it do stuff. You can make it l read information from the environment and do something with that, and then send that up to the Internet or to another computer or whatever it is. And this is, this is uh, people from the project getting to grips with the citizen science kit. It's, yeah, so basically, it's an Arduino board and a, a Wi-Fi shield. And this gives us live readings of uh, nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide and humidity and noise, and a few other things. OK, but it's also about talking about how we're going to campaign with this stuff. You know, like the TV program we just saw. What are we going to do with this stuff? How are we going to make a difference? What, what, what action can we make with our learning out of this project? Because at the end of the day, the, the, the science of this project is not the science of what's important abstractly for some abstract scientific theory. It's what's important for the community. Right? How are we going to use this stuff to make a difference? That's probably the major thing that makes a difference from uh, normal science, if you like. OK, I'm just going to show you a few photos, because I think it's pretty cool. Pull this other one up. So this is, uh, this is putting up the tubes in Clementina, hopefully. Yep. Give that one a few minutes. Go and get a cup of coffee. Got to bring that one up at the same time. 
Okay, partially, you can start to get the idea, right? This is putting the tubes up in Clementina. These are the two tubes that we're putting up. It's really not very hi-fi. Hi it's duct tape, masking tape, and the tubes, trying to take measurements of the air that humans actually breathe, where they live, where the school is, where people go every day, and trying to get a handle on what's actually happening with the power plants and the pollution. And uh, I think I put this link, probably put this link into the uh, list of links. And this is the smart citizen kits going up. So the smart citizen kits, they have, uh, you probably can't see it, but these two outlined in the blue, these are the actual sensors. We've got the Wi-Fi shield, so it connects with the home Wi-Fi network, whoever's hosting the sensor. And it talks to the internet in real time. And it gives, these, it gives the readings. Uh, but we also have to put it in a, an enclosure, because it's going to be outside. So at the moment, the enclosures we're using, let me get these in a bit more detail. The enclosures we're using are, I think, actually, I'm not sure how many euros, but I'm guessing about eight euros worth of plumbing supplies. Okay, because what we need is airflow. We need the air to go in and out. So you can start to make measurements of uh, what the environmental uh, uh, air quality is like. And we need them to be waterproof. So if you turn these things, and, and we need somewhere for the wire to go. So that looks pretty bizarre. But if you turn it upside down, you've got one super waterproof uh, air passage YouTube enclosure for your smart citizen kit. And the guy who uh, developed this idea for the enclosures tested it in his shower. There's, an there's a video of him on the internet testing it in his shower, right? So that it still works in the shower, which is measure the air quality in the shower. Well, pretty good. So that's the smart sitting kits going up. We're putting them on, on. The other key thing about these is putting them up at the same place as some of those tubes that I mentioned. So you've got these things co-located because the digital devices are not as accurate as the ones you send back to the lab. So we've got the best, trying to get the best of both worlds, right? Super accurate readings and super live readings, okay? And these are the super live readings. So this stuff is on the internet now. This is data coming up from the first four or five devices that are up in Clementina, right? Recording this information uh, every few seconds. Uh, let's have a look at um, a bit of temperature there. So, so this is nitrogen dioxide readings for the day. So it's already very interesting because there's a massive spike. So this is already why the digital readings are much more useful uh, in some way than those chemical averages, because it tells us not just on average it's okay or slightly bad. It tells us there are certain points at which this stuff way exceeds, may, may way exceed uh, certain legal limits or certain European limits. And we can have a look at this stuff over the week and see how it varies. Okay, so the next step for us is uh, after we've calibrated these readings against the chemical tubes is to get this stuff tweeting, right? Just so it starts tweeting and saying, hey, we could, we, we'll have detectors up in um, uh, Pristina and Drenas over the next couple of weeks. So you can say, you know, that we'll just get a tweet for starters, saying the nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide or carbon monoxide reading at the corner of this street by the hospital in Pristina has now exceeded the EU limit for a period of 24 hours or whatever it is. Okay, and well, we'll take it from there. Um, how am I doing for time? More or less. Yeah, I'm moving close to the wrap. I just want to say one more thing that I want to say. So that's the citizens. Oh, yeah, well, first off, two things really. Two last things really. One is please join if you find this stuff interesting. This is a pilot project. It's only gonna run till about November. We've got a little bit of money to do it. We're getting seeking funding at the moment for a much more ambitious project because there's lots of other things you can measure with citizen science. Tomorrow there's a workshop, I believe. Right? Bill Allen is doing a workshop where he's gonna use, amongst other things, uh, the, one of the, the uh, Geiger counters that was developed by a project called Safecast, who, which came out of a hackerspace partly in response to the Fukushima radiation release. So this is DIY uh, radiation monitoring. I think there's an application for that in Kosovo. I strongly suspect right, there needs to be a lot more radiation monitoring in Kosovo for various reasons. And there are other kinds of things in the environment that we're already in a position to measure, water quality and so on. And we'd like to expand the project. And we'd definitely like to expand our participation in the project. So that's my, my pitch for the project. Oh, yeah, two, another, two, another two things. Okay, one is education. I just want to talk about education, right? The models of education, this is the recent protests outside the rectorate, just disappearing below the stage there, okay, for the fake qualifications of the former rector. Okay. What are the alternatives for education for Kosovo? At the moment, the choice is between a centralized, politically controlled institution, right, which is completely, completely controlled, right, or privatized business entrepreneurial colleges who are running by the same neoliberal logic of profit maximization. Those are the alternatives for education. And 
I'd just like to point out that everything I've been talking about today, okay, hacker spaces, social innovation camps, citizen science, and everything like it, right, is also a form of learning. It's, it's an alternative form of learning. It's a practice-based form of learning, okay, but it's, it's a different kind of education, different kind of learning, and it's not coming out of either of those models. And I, I just want to finish by saying, I don't know if you can see this, actually. <coughs> I, I chose a, a picture with slightly too fine resolution for this screen. It's basically an animated GIF of two samurai guys right, doing what samurai do, which is like waiting for the other samurai to make a move. Okay? I'm just trying to represent the idea that we're at a decision point, okay? like we always are. Right? We're at a key decision point. Maybe as far as the Internet of Things goes, we're at a key decision point. Okay? And there, there's a choice, as there always is, between that sort of light and dark stuff. And life is never that simple. Uh, but there are some pretty, pretty big choices to be made. Okay, we can take the stuff that's given, use it for the purposes that it was designed for, and end up comfortably in a land of conformity and surveillance. Right? Or we can decide to buck that system a little bit, to bend things, possibly break them even, and come up with some alternative uses right, for these technologies that are explicitly and clearly about justice and fairness and better community. So it's your call. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I do have a Fitbit, and uh, but I'm, I'm promising that you know NSA will not be happy with it. So. My results are awful, but anyway, anyone has any question for Dan? In terms of, you have a question on the microphone. <laughs> Maybe I have a question. Uh, how long do you think it will take about the neoliberalism technology to kind of decentralize on what you're doing? Okay, so the, the about decentralization and technology, I think the NSA stuff, and we're going to get onto that now in some yeah. serious detail, right? The NSA is great in some ways, right? Because it's made everyone pay attention to infrastructure. I teach computing, actually, a lot of the time, okay? And it's a quite amazing. First year computing students have no idea. I say, where's the internet? It's all around us. It's like you're a computing student, right? You, know, you should know about data centers and fiber optic cables, right? There's an infrastructure here. The great thing about the NSA is it totally parasites on that infrastructure, which, which teaches us about the infrastructure. And it teaches us that infrastructure is important. So the idea of decentralization versus neoliberalism or whatever is now becoming, first off, is a question about the internet. What are we going to do about the internet? Do we trash the internet? Forget it? Do we build alternative infrastructures? Then it's also a question about other infrastructures. What about water? What about electricity? What about energy? Right now in the UK, we've got this thing called fracking, right, where they're trying to blow uh, gas out of the ground in a way that massively spreads pollution. So people are talking about what are the alternative energy structures that we can make as a community so we don't have to have this fracking stuff. So I think nobody knows which way this stuff is going to go, but the questions are all on the table right now, which is kind of interesting. We mentioned a lot of NSA helicopters just yeah, coming yeah, totally. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, Teresa has one. This is great, and I'm thinking about Christmas presents for my kids and kits and all that stuff. So my question is, you know, we saw in the DIY fair, the Bonnevet guys have the Arduino boards, and they've got the, the little bits and all that. So it's coming, and I think more people are going to get exposed to it. But how prepared were the participants to kind of get muck in with that stuff and touch things and pull things apart and figure out how it worked and, and make all that work? Because I, I sometimes feel in the things that we do here, that people aren't as comfortable or that they, they think it's only for the geeks to, to mess around with that stuff. So how comfortable were they with it? Uh, okay, dokie. So how, how able, in a way, are people to get in touch with uh, the potential in these devices? I, I, I'm just trying to pull up a photo again, actually, because I think it uh, kind of speaks for itself. We had a really fun guy called Alex. So it depends a lot on people, right? Depends on how you present this stuff. This is a really fun guy called Alex who came from the Smart Citizen Project. I like this photo, right? Even in the UK at the moment, you know, there's a massive gender discrimination in terms of technology. These girls aren't supposed to be interested in technology. They definitely aren't supposed to understand it. But that's why I think something like critical pedagogy is a useful way of getting people involved in it. Because it's not about the technology. The goal here is not, yeah, I understand some technology. The goal here is what's happening with the air that I breathe, right? And this thing can help me, so I'm going to understand it. 
So that's one possibility, right? I think with all this technology stuff, it's not focusing on the technology and saying, hey, that's really cool. I'm somebody who understands Arduino. I don't give a shit. Okay? What are you going to use it for? Right? What, what kind of approach? So it's also about the social.